this review is going to be very different from my average videos mainly because I won't be able to show the game which is a pity because this is a really nice looking game but I'm traveling through Italy these days if I don't film now I don't know when I'll be able to film things are going to pile up soon in my schedule and my games are packed away right now so I'll tell about the game if you want to see pictures of the game go on board game geek there are nice pictures uh, really nice looking game try to imagine the game from my words from what I'm going to tell you in my video for the Dark Valley the Dark Valley by GMT this is a word game one or two player game one player option because it is a very solo friendly game it is a game about uh, World War II in the East, so it is about Barbarossa, the Barbarossa campaign. Uh, uh, this game has been called a mini monster. I don't see anything mini about this game. I would call it a semi monster or a playable monster. That means that there's a large map, larger than most, but not as large as you have in many monster war games. It is two large maps that are placed adjacent to one another to represent the area of a Operation of the Barbarossa campaign. Um, number of counters is elevated but not as much as you have in other monster games. The monster feeling comes from a certain epic uh, angle that there is to the story, to a certain epic approach. Yes, you have many counters, yes, you have a large operation, yes, you have a lot of things that happen. A broad scope, I would say. Uh, at the same time, you do not have the same level of complexity that you have in many monster games. This is definitely one of the most playable monster games that I've never that I've ever come across. It is less than 30 pages of rules, so the rules are very clear, and the core rules, so the, the core engine is extremely simple. Uh, there is a little bit of nitpicking here and there, but of course you need that to have some chrome, to have some circle feel, um, and that little bit of nitpicking comes uh, when uh, when you have to upgrade units, to replace units, you have to uh, retire units. Uh, certain things that happen in the biological life of the units as the Barbarossa campaign progresses, as the political systems behind the two sides impose different rules, restrictions to the to the combatants and also at the same time uh, new things open up, new possibilities open up. For example, as you can expect, Russia uh, becomes more and more industrialized, the production increases, you can bring in more reinforcements and replacements. The game plays along historical lines, which is what you would expect and probably what you want, uh, at least broadly speaking. Um, so yes, okay, back to the main point. Yes, there's a bit of, there is a little bit of nitpicking here and there, but the core engine, the core system is very simple. What are the main ideas behind, behind the engine, behind the system? First thing, chit pull. Hooray! This is one of my favorite mechanics, possibly my favorite mechanic in war games. Give me a chit, I'll pull it. That's just the kind of war gamer I am. Um, here you have a chit pull engine so that units are activated based on random drawing of chits that are placed in a cup uh, and these chits work in a slightly different ways from what you have in many other games. Usually you have games that just tell you this formation activates and all the units belonging to that formation activate. Here the chits do not only regulate the units and activate but also what they do. For example there is a chit that will allow all the units to move or all the units to uh, perform combat and you choose which one. A chit that will only allow you to perform combat. A chit that will allow you to perform combat with all of your units and then move your units or move all of your units first but then only perform combat with mechanized units. Uh, there is the counter-attack chit for the Soviet player and that chit will allow you to move units to attack the opponent but then the units that you activated for movement have to attack. The point is that they move precisely so that they can get in a position to attack. Uh, 
so it's not a standard thing activate and that's it the shit that you pull regulates also the kind of things that you can do with the units that you activate the mix of chits changes throughout the game depending on the scenario instructions which is a very elegant way of factoring in certain uh, changing elements in the campaign there's a logistics chit which imposes uh, the moment in which you check supplies so you check supply when the chit is drawn and that makes the game very exciting because you do not have the gamey situation oh my unit starts to supply but i have until the end of the turn uh, to to fix the situation you do not know exactly when the next check is going to strike and that is pretty fun good stuff there i really like the chat pool engine in general and i love the way in which it has been implemented here once you have determined the type of impulse by drawing an activation chit, it is time to, well, to activate your units. Movement and combat are the two things that you'll be doing mainly. Uh, movement, pretty standard, you will move the units that can activate um, up to their full movement allowance, which is printed on each counter, indicating a unit. Um, and movement will be affected by terrain, the cost to enter different hexes will change depending on terrain in it, there are effects based on weather, the weather changes throughout the game depending on the turn that you're playing, very important of course in any game depicting the Russian campaign and um, act, uh, zones of control. Zones of control also are important because units have to halt movement when they enter an enemy zone of control and units cannot move directly from a zone of control to another with some small exceptions. What is neat though is that not all units uh, project a zone of control those who do project a zone of control in the six hexes around them. Not all units have that ability, there is a symbol on the units that can do that. What is also neat is that even units that project a zone of control may not always be able to do so. For example, if they are reduced to a point in which, well, they are not able to, to project a zone of control anymore, then when you are moving around those units you do not have to worry about the zone control anymore uh, and there is a symbol as I said on units that are able to project that but that symbol may not be on all sides of the counter representing the unit so you may have a unit that projects on a control when it is in full strength takes a hit, loses a step, it is flipped on the other side and there is no symbol for zone of control there so the unit cannot do that uh, maybe the unit will recover later than it is brought back to its previous glory and it has zone of control again nice um, these are the generals for movement there's also strategic movement that becomes a factor later in the game earlier for the Russians and later for the Germans um, which allow and strategic movement allows the players to move a certain amount of units um, for particularly long uh, long distances which is good uh, combat though oh, I want to talk about combat because combat is fun and if you play war games you probably enjoy resolving combat here combat is resolved in a very simple very linear standard way kind of introductory war game level of complexity you total together the um, attack factor of all the units that are attacking uh, and you also total together the defense factor of all the units that are defending. You compute combat odds and then you look at a combat table, you roll a die, apply modifiers based on the situation and ta you will have the result and you will see if one of the two sides takes hits, if one of the two sides has to retreat, things like this. The only wrinkle to this, the only thing that is not very usual, not to be found in many war games, is that you have two combat tables and um, you have to use either depending on several situations. For example, um, the Germans tend to use one of the tables, so the, the Soviets use one of the tables in one part of the game and another table in another part. Uh, it depends on the two sides and also on the turns, on the on the 
on the period in which the fight is happening and that of course depicts different capabilities that the two sides have uh, to fight effectively. Um, I like this, I like the way in which this uh, factors in a lot of things. Um, it manages to add out of Chrome without uh, having to add a lot of rules that you had to memorize and implement. Look at a combat table, roll dice, see what happens and things will tend to happen um, along historical lines, really neat. Um, other things that are important, lines of supply and lines of communication, those are interrupted by enemy units and enemies also control. Um, a line of supply is a line of variable length to a supply source. A line of communication is a line of any length to a supply source. If you do not have a line of supply, you have negative effects. You have even worse effects if you are not able to trace a line of any distance to any source, then you do not have communication. Really bad, bad, bad things happen. Um, for supplies, uh, the uh, Soviet player relies mainly on railroads. The uh, German player relies on railroads too, but also on depots that can be moved and should be moved throughout the campaign. Um, speaking about the units that are moved, that I forgot about the type of unit, which is air units. Air units are based around airports. The German player also needs to move airports, to relocate airports, to, um, to transfer the range that the air units of the German player can cover. And air units can be used to support combat, uh, to support land combat, or to bombard, ha bombard enemy access, that is, to uh, perform operations by themselves. And that's pretty much it. It's pretty basic if you, if you think about it, especially if you consider that this is uh, and feels like a mini monster, somewhat of a monster. Uh, and yet the core engine is so linear. You simply draw chits and the type of chit that you draw will tell you the impulse that you have to resolve. Resolve the impulse by resolving movement in a standard way, resolving combat in a pretty basic way, um, taking into account things such as logistics. The logistic chit will be pretty key there. Uh, determining how well you did and in creating effects that you will have to take into account. That being done, you simply draw the chits that apply to your turn, repeat the procedure for the number of turns uh, in the scenario that you have to set it to play, and voila, that's it. And you will see the Russian campaign uh, taking place before your very eyes. So, not a game that is hard to play, but of course what's important is that is this a game that is fun to play? Heck. Yes, this is a game that I enjoyed a huge deal, not a big deal, not a great deal, a huge deal. Uh, fun, just so much stuff happening. The front uh, Russian campaign games have the sense of, 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 of like a snake. I, I like this, the shape visually even of the, the front that moves on the map, uh, the German front as the Soviet front is destroyed, rebuilt, uh, interrupted, uh, surrounded by huge pockets and yet somehow slowly and miraculously it reforms and it starts pushing against the other snake. Uh, this is something that you have in games uh, about the Russian campaign at the strategic level and the capture the historical event. It does happen here. It has even, a, a, again, a visual, aesthetic, rhythmic quality, um, which of course also corresponds to a narrative quality because the game tells your story as it does that, as these, uh, these forces, these dynamic groups of units interact. The game really creates the sense of this huge scale event with so much complexity going on and yet it does happen in a game that is very playable, very manageable. If you're playing the campaign game it will take you a while to play, you will need to keep it set up for a while, but it's such a joy to, to see it there when you're doing other stuff, then you look at the table where the game is set up, you think about stuff, maybe maybe you, you draw a chit and you play a little impulse there. This is a game that is very solitaire friendly and that's the way I played it just keeping it set up on my desk for quite a while, doing other stuff in the meanwhile, 
um, and playing other games too. Uh, but it is a game that has such a strong story that you can take even long breaks. The game is still waiting for you. The feeling is waiting for you. The, the, the aesthetic engine of the game is always ready uh, to be turned on without much effort. And the fact that you do not have to review a million rules if you took a break between sessions, that's another huge advantage too. The Dark Valley is to me a phenomenal representation of the Russian campaign. It is an astoundingly playable game, one that I enjoyed immensely. Um, I was I was really lucky in, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I played some of the most fun games, some of the most fun war games that I played in a long time. I enjoyed a lot Empire of the Sun. I enjoyed Crusader Revolution and I enjoyed the Dark Valley immensely. Uh, the Dark Valley and the Crusader Revolution probably are my favorite war games of 2014. Doesn't mean that they came out in 2014, I believe the Crusader Revolution actually is from before, but definitely two of the most fun, I'd say the most fun games that they played in 2014. It is June, there's still time to play more games, but I have to tell you, Dark Valley, The Dark Valley is a great game, one of the best games that I played in a long time, a phenomenal war game about this topic, one of my favorite ones about this topic, right there together with No Retreat, completely different feel, completely different ideas behind it, uh, but great representations of this event, great war games. I can already tell you that The Dark Valley will be one uh, will be very high in my uh, top 10 war games of 2014. I can only recommend that you give it a try if you're a war gamer. Even if you're just considering starting war gaming, this could be a fantastic entryway. If you're a seasoned war gamer, you will enjoy it even more. Um, I just can't imagine somebody who is not in, who is interested in war gaming not enjoying this game. This is how much I enjoyed it and I hope you can enjoy it too.